Fantastic. I'm just waiting for people to join. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, so welcome everyone to the Photo Book Weekend presented by the Ballarat International Photo Biennale. My name is Serena Muellerman and I'm a producer at the Biennale and it's a pleasure to welcome you all today and thank you for joining. Um, so firstly, I would like to acknowledge that the Biennale takes place on the land of the Wadawurrung and Jajawurrung people and I pay my respect to their elders past present and emerging. Um, and the Biennale would also like to thank our lead partners, Spices, Bauhaus and Hannah Moore, and our major government partners, the City of Ballarat, Creative Victoria, Visit Victoria, and the Australian Government through the RISE Fund for their ongoing support. Um, so thank you all again. I am so pleased to introduce this conversation event with Heidi Victoria and Julie McLaren. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. Um, Heidi Victoria is an award-winning photographer, portraitist and former MP in the Victorian Parliament and Minister for the Arts, Women's Affairs and Consumer Affairs. Now, having graduated as a photographer over 30 years ago, Heidi soon became a voice for the arts industry, serving in the Parliament of Victoria for 12 years. Heidi always yearned to return to her first love of photography and now specialises in environmental, theatrical and documentary photography. Today, Heidi will discuss her recent series and photo book, The Show Must Go On. Um, so created in 2020, this photographic series showcases the resilience of the performing arts industry. So a big thank you to Heidi for joining us today. Um, and for those who may not know, Julie McLaren is a curator with close to 15 years of experience working in the museum um, and gallery industry. She is passionate about using art to tell engaging stories and to connect with community through fostering a collaborative and inclusive approach. Uh, following her roles at the National Film and Sound Archive, the National Museum of Australia and the Ballarat International Photo Biennale, Julie joined the Art Gallery of Ballarat team in 2009 and has been in the role of curator since 2016. During this time, she has curated more than 50 small and large scale exhibitions with artists working across varying um, time periods and mediums. Um, so thank you both so much. I am so pleased to hand over the conversation um, to our guest speakers, Heidi Victoria and Julie McLaren. Thank you so much, Serena, for that introduction. And um, I would just like to acknowledge that I'm um, joining this conversation here um, today from Wadawurrung Country as well. So I'm fortunate enough to have been able to see a lot of the photo biennale. Um, hopefully um, we reach a point soon where um, Melbourne audiences can join us here in the regions, um, which we'll discuss a little bit more with Heidi. Um, Heidi, it's lovely to meet you and have a chat with you. Hopefully at one, some stage, we get to meet face to face but it's good that'd to be see. great julie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for those not in melbourne lucky you yes so um serena gave a great introduction to um to your background which is really intriguing politics and and photography so maybe we could start by talking about about a little bit more about your background and what it is that is drawing you back into um exploring photography again it's always been my love it's funny, um, you know, we only have an hour, otherwise I'd tell you how I fell into photography and it was quite by accident. I was going to be an accountant. Um, and for anybody who knows me, they'll be laughing right now and going, she's so not an accountant. Um, and I, I guess once I, you know, life took me to lots of really interesting places, including politics and being Minister for the Arts is probably, you know, the absolute career highlight for me because as an artist I actually obviously understand the industry um, and I used to joke I know what it's like to eat two minute noodles and Vegemite sandwiches <laughs> you know when you're a budding artist um, and you know one thing led to another I did I did go into politics although not being a, a very political animal you know that was never my comfort space but I did enjoy getting things done and um, and then in 2018 when I um, left the parliament it just became really obvious that I needed to go back and keep that right side of my brain happy again because it had been suppressed for a little while. And um, so it was logical for me to go back to photography. Of course, I didn't know then that COVID was going to hit. So a, um, a 
I guess a re-emerging or a fledgling, you know, career was kind of snapped out at, mm. uh, at the beginning of uh, last year. But you haven't left behind the, um, the advocacy work, I suppose, you were doing when you were working in politics and the arts. Um, this series, The Show Must Go On, really is about advocating, still advocating for artists and, and the importance of their role in society. So yeah. can you expand a little bit on, on you know, obviously we, we discussed earlier that we weren't going to use the word pivot, um, <laughs> but um, you were um, starting to re-emerge um, re as, a, as a photographer um, and how did you reach the point where this was the particular series that you wanted to focus on in 2020? It, it again, as so many things in my life, happened about by chance. And so um, I've been quite public. I had a health scare early last year and um, sat at home and it sort of happened about a week before COVID lockdown. So everything sort of happened at once. And I, um, I guess I didn't know what was going to be next for me, not only as a photographer, but where, you know, what sort of role I would take in, in the future. And so I, when we went into lockdown and theatre was closed, which, you know, I mean, I was at the theatre between five and seven nights a week. I love this, you know, I love the theatre. It's my happy space. And, um, and so I thought, well, if I'm sitting at home, what are the practitioners doing? So what are the, the professionals from within the performing arts doing? So whether they are a big name who we're used to seeing in the spotlight or whether they are, you know, the person who does hair, wigs and makeup on a show or, um, you know, a comedian who might do, you know, corporate gigs, what are they doing? You know, um, directors of sound and lighting, that sort of thing. And so I got out um, my phone and rang all of my friends in the industry and said, what are you doing? And they said, well, you know, not much really. So it sort of then manifested into well, what were they doing when they weren't doing what we know they do? Mm. And so I rang um, Rhonda Birchmore was one of the first people I rang and I said, Bruta, what are you doing? And she said, well, she said, I've got a passion for glass. And I went, you know what? And we'll get to that photo. I'm going to obviously show a few photos. And But she said, I've, I've never had time because she's one of the busiest people working in the arts in Australia. Um, and so she sort of said, well, I finally got time to do something I've always wanted to do. And that was a recurring theme. And I thought, that's great. They're not earning any money doing these things, but it is something that their right brain's telling them that they've got to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then for others, of course, it was all about how do I survive? So how do I do something that is actually going to bring in um, an income for my family? So a particularly well-known Australian actor was going off and doing um, lawn mowing rounds mm -hmm. for cash. Yeah. Um, and if you want to know who it is, you'll have to buy the book <laughs> because everybody has written their own story. So, yeah, this was very much an advocacy piece. It started off as being, um, in my mind, an, an exhibition of about 20 images, so a small exhibition. And then it kept growing. And I would, you know, go to somebody's home when we're still allowed um, and photograph them and they'd say, oh, have you got so-and-so in your series? And I'd say, no. And they go, well, you've got to. And they'd pick up the phone and go, I've got hides here. Can she come over and see you? And I was shooting sometimes three and four portraits in a day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when it got up to 72 people <laughs> photographed, um, we then had the 5K restriction come in and it kind of brought a natural end to the, the series. Um, I kind of got to the stage where I thought, gee, maybe I'll make it to 100. But on the advocacy side of things, the important thing for me was to be able to, and it's such a privilege going into people's homes and capturing the side of them that they don't usually show to the public. Um, and so being able to, to do that, but then ask them to write their own stories. Mm -hmm. And that was the advocacy side of things. I mean, I could take portraits of almost anybody I love portraiture mm. um, it's funny I was talking with a photographer last weekend who's a food photographer and she said I can't photograph anything with a heartbeat <laughs> and I said isn't that funny because I'm not really good at inanimate 
objects. So, you know, we're all specialists, like, you know, a surgeon who does brain surgery doesn't do knee surgery. You know, we all have our own things that we're good at. And, um, and so to be able to produce a series of photographs that I'm very proud of, but then have everybody contribute their story, um, yes, it became a, a really big advocacy piece rather than a political piece. Um, and so I have presented it to the Federal Arts Minister and it's gone to a few arts ministers around the country and every time I see one, you know, I present one and just say, please read the stories. Please see what was happening to our industry. Um, and as a, you know, theatrical photographer as well, I do say our industry because I'm very much part of that. Um, and so it's, you know, you can find it in the State Library and the National Library and I want people to be able to flip back on it in years to come, you know, because this won't be the only pandemic we have. Mm. Um, and I want them to be able to say, okay, things are bleak at the moment. How did people survive? They'll pick up, they'll read the stories, hopefully be inspired. There are a couple of bleak stories in there, I will warn you. Um, but mostly they are silver lining stories. And um, I mean, your initial intention was to hold an exhibition, but it has yeah. grown into the book, into book four, <laughs> which, which we'll expand on a little bit later on. But perhaps we could start um, looking at some of the, the images. And yeah. um, I mean, I think in my bio, it says I'm all about telling stories and, and connecting with people. And, and I can see that that's what you're passionate about too. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing some of the stories. And um, obviously, we don't have a huge amount of time to go into all of them but um I look forward to seeing um some of the your favorites so thank you well start. it's just a little a little snapshot shot of some of them so if I can get that happening I know I can get that happening So, you know, back at the beginning of COVID, when artists were wondering what it was that they were going to do, and I'm talking specifically performing artists at this stage, um, and I want to actually acknowledge all the other artists. So, you know, the, the two-dimensional visual artists, and, and I was talking to a um, three-dimensional, but, a, you know, a sculptor yesterday, a beautiful young man called Sam, who is questioning where he's at in his career and, and just, you know, a beautiful human being. So it's not just hit performing artists I acknowledge that you know this has hit an awful lot of, of people across all industries but John was one of the first people so John Foreman um, was one of the first people to say let's go digital if we can't meet up if we can't get into concert halls can we please just bring joy and one of the very early collaborative pieces was um, what a wonderful world and you can see there John's at home he was doing his big night in for Art Centre Melbourne and on the screen are all the people he was um, conducting, if you like, in their parts in What a Wonderful World. And, uh, and I said to him, please put the tux on, but of course he's still in his jeans and, and you know, I won't tell you, I'm, I've got my slippers on right now. Um, and we, you know, we, we learned to do that with Zoom. So it, it was kind of good. So that was kind of the start and we didn't know how long this would go on or just how bleak it was going to be. Hmm. You got somebody like Tyron Park, and uh, and when I rang Tyron, and of course he's a director, he's a phenomenal performer, beautiful voice, but he's also um, you know one of the leads over at the VCA, the the College of the Arts in their music theatre um, program. And I said to him, "What are you doing?" And he said, "Well, he said I love Dr. Seuss, so I am a little bit more lowbrow than some of my colleagues, but I'm reading Dr. Seuss, and I'm." putting a voice to Dr. Zeus. And I said, how fabulous. And he said, and I do it in the bath. And I went, I'm so photographing you in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that picture came about. But of course he picked the best Dr. Zeus book for the time, all the places mm -hmm. you go. And it was kind of, we can't, but thanks Tyron for making us believe we could. Mm. This was a, a fun photo. So there were a whole lot of people who, you know, We'll try not to use the pivot word too much, but um, many people would know Dolly Diamond, um, a great advocate who's actually just moved back to the UK, um, but a great advocate for the um, LGBTQI plus community. And um, so Dolly and Kerry um, started doing this thing called the house party. 
And it was about bringing joy to the community a um, couple of nights a week, but it was all done from um, Dolly's alter ego, Michael Dalton. Um, it was done from his lounge room. So I turned up at his apartment in Elwood and there he was um, obviously on the right there um, saying, well, welcome to my world. So a tiny apartment was taken over as a, a film studio, basically. So this was an interesting photo because it took three hours to take. Mm. Um, so I think, I think what a lot of what these um, a couple of these images so far are showing is the um, the generosity of the arts community. So <sighs> people could have become really insular and and you know just kept their apartment to themselves, but people yeah. literally started sharing their internal their, their lives um, at yep. home um, with a huge number of people. Yeah, absolutely. And you know this was this was a great way for Michael to be able to continue obviously earning an income, but also to know that when he converts over to Dolly or transforms, that he could then go and bring a lot of joy and happiness to people as well. It was a real variety show. And uh, so I love this photo because it's so bright. Um, it's hanging over at Monash Gallery at the moment as well, I think, in, in one of their exhibitions. Um, and this is just, you know, the joy. And, and as Michael said at the time, he said, Dolly and I are two separate people. Mm. So to have us photographed, you know, together is highly unusual. People who were still able to, I guess, practice their craft but not use it um, professionally, people like Arco Kondo and, and um, Cheng Guo and Ted and Chok, we've got to put the fur babies in there because Ted and Chok are their babies. But you can imagine, you know, the two most popular dancers with the Australian Ballet, and they weren't allowed anywhere near the ballet building. Mm. And they live in a small apartment in South Bank. And so they had a bar bought in and they were, and they're used to rehearsing seven or eight hours a day. And so, you know, this photograph, I guess, is all about obviously the arts and where they would usually perform, but also about how they were keeping fit and what they were doing in their spare time. And, um, you know, Chen was doing a lot of um, boxing to keep fit. Yeah, and what is... I see in this is the, is the strength. Once again, resilience is a very overused word um, yeah. at the moment, but the strength, um, yeah, both physical in this, yeah. uh, literally physical in this, but, um, but in the broader sense of the, the arts community. Um, yeah, mm. and the fact that they still had that demeanour, they weren't in any way, shape or form beaten. You know, they were proud and still loving their craft and, and what they do. This portrait of Wilbur Wilde um, was again, you know, Willie couldn't get out and do gigs, which, you know, is what he's known for. Um, but he was still able to practice. So he practices a lot actually because he's in an apartment building. He practices a lot in the car park. <laughs> it wasn't great for photography so I said can we go somewhere else so we went up to the rooftop and um and photographed from there but this is actually um in the selection of the number one Gadinsky exhibition that's showing currently for the um, Ballarat International Photo Biennale mm -hmm. and so if you get up folks to see the Linda McCartney exhibition which I was supposed to see this morning I'm dying to see it um but if you haven't booked your tickets for that please do um, but there's also, of course, the number one Gadinsky honouring Michael's work uh, and the Frontier Touring Company, as well as Mushroom Records. And so this image is part of that exhibition, as well as being part of the show must go on. But you just look at the joy. This man just doesn't have a sad moment. He's great. No. <laughs> then there was the those that were being really clever. So obviously there was um, the closure of filming and you know all of the film sets and, and things around the country that were had gone down but one production that managed to keep going was Neighbours and so this was shot at the Nunawadding studios of, of where Neighbours is uh, is filmed and some of you will recognize Sally Ann Upton or Nurse Upton as she was known so Sally Ann's mum had told her years ago, never give up your nursing qualifications, always have it as a backstop. And so Sal, of course, appears on Neighbours every now and again. She's in lots of things. She's also a marriage celebrant. So all of her, 
her income earning world sort of was decimated. And she, um, she was called by the producers and, and said, well, we can continue, we can rewrite the script so that we can film people, you know, way apart, but make it look like they're together. Um, but we need somebody to absolutely make sure that nobody with COVID comes onto the premises. And so they got permission to continue filming. And I wasn't allowed to walk onto the premises. So you can see I'm out at the guardhouse. <laughs> Sal's on the other side of the barrier. Um, and I like what she's written in the book. And that is that COVID has been a real leveller. And so it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, the person doing the catering or the garbage collection or whether you're the director or writer. You are not coming past that barrier without having your temperature taken by Nurse Upton. And I thought that, you know, resilience, they, they were really clever in what they did with the, with the filming and the production, and they had an awful lot of people being able to continue working and because so they were a, smart. She's a friendly but formidable force, obviously. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't want to cross Sal in the nicest <laughs> way. She is just fabulous, but she knows what she wants. Mm -hmm. And, of course, she's also um, very high up in the Actors Benevolent Fund, and they have been really instrumental in helping an awful lot of people who haven't been able to you know own you know I get I guess um you know be self-sufficient during COVID. Beautiful Martin Croft. Um, Martin very fine practitioner actor on his own um, in his own right but also resident director on things like you know Jersey Boys and Come From Away and those sort of things. And when I turned up to photograph Martin his husband was um, stuck overseas he'd been away visiting and couldn't come home and he said he'd, he'd redesigned their garden which is a, a very small garden many times he said there's nothing else to do and then he remembered that his mother and grandmother had taught him to knit and he said who'd have thought that spotlight was an essential service but spotlight early on was still open so he raced down and bought some wool and so he started to revive some old things, some comfort things. And I found that as a common theme amongst so many people. Um, and so here is Martin knitting a scarf. And the funny thing was when I went to go and, and um, visit a, another portrait sitter about a week later, she was wearing that scarf. And I said to Lucy, I know where you got that scarf. She said, I bet you don't. I said, I bet I do. And by the way, your scarf features in my book. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was great to see that people had gone back to comfort mm. and gone back to what they knew would not challenge them, I guess, just to bring them joy. And it also, I mean, a lot of people were returning to old photo albums and almost nostalgia related related to childhood or youth. Cooking. Or, <laughs> yes, oh, and cooking, of course. Oh. I didn't turn to bread baking myself. <laughs> I did, but then I'm a great, you know, I'm a, I'm a really keen cook anyway. But it was funny because when I turned up to photograph David McAllister, of course, you know, who was one of the most beautiful principal dancers of the Australian Ballet and then their artistic director for 20 years or whatever it was, he had baked the most beautiful looking cake, but he was taking it to somebody's house. So I didn't even get to try it. But um, but there is, is um, the photo is, is of David standing in his kitchen with his apron on and you know mm -hmm. doing the domestics which was lovely here's a photo I was talking about before of Rhonda so Rhonda you know designed these beautiful mosaics there's three of them um, the green sea turtle is one and they're to go in an outdoor area at her home and um, she was cutting all the glass herself and you know grouting it all and doing it and just amazing Mm. Um, and again that was something she never thought she'd have time to do but she'd been hoarding all this glass she loves glass and um and I think her husband Nick had said to her at one stage you know what is going to happen with the glass and COVID gave her that opportunity to go off and do something completely different and of course she had a year of bookings like you know a, as busy as anybody I'd ever seen because she'd just come out of the jungle and uh, so her her public face, if you like, was even more well known because of, there was a whole new generation of people, young people, who were seeing Rhonda Birchmore for the first time. Mm. Um, 
And a lot of these activities are um, also, I mean, I think what drew people to think activities like knitting or mosaic in Rhonda's case is that they're um, activities that you focus really um, intensely on and it kind of is a bit of an escape um, from what's happening in the world too. Yeah. And it made them happy. So you're absolutely right. A lot of this was about escapism. Mm -hmm. If we look at, at Lockie here, so Lachlan is a, a, a terrific also a straight actor, uh, a dramatic actor. And he said to me, would you photograph me? I'm trying to perfect the art of drag and it is an art. And so this was not a, a public face he'd you know, had out and about. Um, and he said, I am really enjoying the whole zen of learning makeup and if you look at somebody like Michael Dalton, Dolly Diamond earlier in the, the photographs, you know, you would never photograph Michael in transition to Dolly. Um, whereas Lockie actually wanted to be photographed like this to show, you know, that there is a transitioning happening. Mm. And I think that was so indicative of what was happening during COVID. But a very strong, very strong image and a very proud man who had, you know, just learnt these beautiful skills. This was the height of COVID. So some people will recognise Clayton Jacobson. No, it's not Shane, it's his brother. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's Clay in the middle. And uh, this was when we really didn't know how far COVID was going to go. So it was winter. They live on a, a property in the country. His partner Vic is behind him. His dad, Ron, is in front of him. So because it was you know, it was rife. It was when the nursing home um, deaths were happening and that sort of thing. And people were scared. You know, we were wearing rubber gloves and doing all that sort of thing. And so Clay agreed that I could come and photograph him, but I couldn't have any contact with them. And I had to stay right away. They hadn't seen another human being for a couple of months at this stage. Clayton was using the time to make um, or document his dad's life. So Ron is... Um, is carny folk and he wanted to tell the story of somebody from the circus but they're all musical and so Clayton had taught Vic how to play the um the double bass and Ron's at the front there with his blues harp and they gave me a little bluegrass uh concert if you like while I was photographing them but it was interesting you know because of that the scare factor, if you like, at that time, I had to let them know when I arrived, stand up one end of um, their beautiful home, have a very long lens on, and then let them know I was ready. They came out. We were many, many metres apart. Um, the release form uh, that everybody signed um, was left for them to bring their own pen out and sign and then left for me to take away. So they came out, I photographed them. We had a chat from quite a way away. They went back into the house and then I was allowed to leave again. Mm -hmm. So it was a very interesting process as a photographer to not, you know, and it, we're a very huggy, kissy sort of an industry. <laughs> and to, to not be able to do that was um, very foreign. Mm. But wasn't music such an important part of, um, or hasn't it been such an important part of, um, keeping everyone going it Check has mm. it brings joy mm. then we've got my lovely friend Krista Vandy who um you know is an extremely well-known actress and model and just a, a good human being and Krista was homeschooling the boys who are in primary school and she was also learning to cook and you know and, and cooking even more and she's a dag she won't mind me saying it but she's a dag so she'd have on music and she'd just be dancing around the place so in this photograph we wanted to encapsulate the fact that yes she was homeschooling so you've got certificates from the kids you know behind her there and she's a really proud mum and um and then you know having a dance in the kitchen with the pots and pans and just the fact that there were so many artists who couldn't usually spend time with their kids because they were touring or filming or whatever it was actually a really good time for them you know and they could spend more time with their kids and that was that was a good theme as well that there were a lot of people who could see that silver lining I guess 
Alinta Chidzi, some of you will um, recognise the beautiful Alinta. She's, of course, about to, well, I say about to star, started starring in, and it's all on hiatus at the moment, as Satine in Moulin Rouge, and her baby at the time, Rufus. And, um, you know, we see her, uh, we saw her as Velma Kelly in um, Chicago, and she is one of the most beautiful, stunning, glamorous, statuesque, you know, talented, gorgeous women you'll ever see. And here she was allowing me into her kitchen and her and Rufus having a very quiet moment, you know, no makeup, just very natural. And that's why I say it's such a privilege to be able to, you know, I suppose portray people in a way that they wouldn't usually go out and show people. Yeah. Um, and of course, she's had a, a baby since. And so Harley Rose is just, you know, very little still, but uh, accompanies mum to rehearsals for Moulin Rouge. And yeah, it's a great time. So COVID was a real game changer for her and Remco. This is um, Stephen Curry. And I love the humour. I'm actually going to just pull out the book. So this is, this is the book. Oh, I hate Zoom for this. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I never get it quite right. It's camouflaged at the moment. Uh, anyway, there's a book. <laughs> if I ha there you go. If I hold it on the angle, so it's a it's quite a big um, coffee table book, and of course we're celebrating um, in you know International Photographic um, Book Weekend. Um, and if I go to it, so it's all in alphabetical order because I know we're going to talk about the making of the book, but I will say in here that. Um, <laughs> When you do a book on the performing arts and there are a lot of egos involved in the performing arts in the nicest way, but I decided to make it square. People said, wow, that's interesting. You know, it's more expensive to produce in that way. And I decided to make it big. So it's a coffee table book. And I said, but if it's not square, somebody's gonna complain that their photograph because it's portrait rather than landscape is bigger than somebody else's. So I said, it's going to be square and everybody's image size is going to be identical. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to put it in alphabetical order of name. Because if one person is earlier in the book than somebody else, I didn't want to cause any sort of riff. So I'm just going to read to you what Stephen put in. And many of you would know him from you know, his days in the castle and, and all of those sort of things. And I asked everybody, what do you want to be called? And um, Stephen said, um, professional pretender. Which I love. So there's lots of humour in this book. And he says, I built this outhouse in the outback before the outbreak with nothing but my bare hands and a hammer and some nails and a saw. So I guess the whole nothing but my bare hands thing is nothing but a bare face lie. Oh, better out than in. <laughs> and so, you know, there's, there's some really beautiful little stories and there are some very heartfelt um, ones. There are some real digs at governments of various persuasions. Um, so as I said, it's, you know, it's a, it's a good bit of variety, this book. And but, did you uh, give people free reign when it came to what, what they wrote about? Yes. The company their their Nothing um, was edited. Right. Except yeah. typos. Yeah. But if you're watching and you had a, had a typo, don't worry, I fixed it up. Um, but no, I, I said to them, go hell for leather, whatever you want to write about, that is your story. And I want to be authentic in this project. Um, and so when this exhibition so it did actually eventuate as an exhibition of some 40 plus prints um which was the autumn salon show at Sofitel earlier this year and and I actually had wall talkers made so that people could read the stories so you know they're, they're nice portraits lovely portraits on their own but it's only when you go and put something like that with it and of course you know Stephen having starred in the castle everybody remembers the line how's the serenity and when we turned up at his country property, which he shares with his brothers and their families, um, I said to him, do you know, does everybody say the same thing when they drive in through those gates? He said, yep, how's the serenity? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and this is pretty well the only structure on the block. So they have a, a caravan each. And this is the dunny. Mm -hmm. 
and I just thought <laughs> we just cool their hands <laughs> exactly so you know very 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 cool and it's just the nicest man this is Virginia Lovett standing on the stage um, at the South Bank Theatres um, you know she's the head of the Melbourne Theatre Company and again this is one where I couldn't touch door handles we didn't share a pen um, you know, we, we always give each other a hug and kiss to say hi, and we couldn't do that. Mm. And so we decided on the ghost light because for, you know, anybody that's not particularly familiar with the theatre in pretty well every theatre around the world, a ghost light stays on stage when the stage is not in use. And it's a very old tradition, and it was a safety thing, obviously, early on before they had electric lights and, and it's a, a, guessing so a few actors if they were sticking around didn't have a few bevies and fall off the edge of the stage who knows we can make up our own stories um but as Virginia says in her piece the theatre will return you know and they've had to cancel pretty well all of this year but they are back and season 2022 looks amazing so if you haven't got your subscriptions to all your favorite theatre companies and performing companies please do support them um so this was a very special haunting image I'm not really allowed to have a favourite baby, but this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry to all the others who are on. on yeah, just don't on. tell anyone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a reason for, for having a, a favourite baby here, and that's because of the circumstances. So we've got here, this was taken in Bathurst, so at this stage we're still allowed to cross borders. And so I drove up to, to Sydney to, to do some shoots up there. And on the way, I stopped in on the boys. So on the left, you've got Ainsley Mellum. On the right, you've got Callum Francis. So um, if you like, Aladdin and Lola from Kinky Boots. And, um, and uh, Blackie and Lizzie, the two horses. And I call this image from Broadway to Bathurst. These boys, and I went to in uh, early 19, 2019, I flew to New York to see them both perform on, on Broadway. And um, they were both, you know, leading men at the time, which is incredibly unusual to have a couple both taking leads in separate shows on Broadway at the same time, especially, you know, two boys, I'll say from Australia, because Callum's originally from, from England and came out here for Kinky Boots for us. And they had packed up their home in Sydney and were about to return to Broadway for Ainsley being invited back to do a second season of Aladdin. And COVID hit two days before they were due to hop on a plane. So they had no home, everything was in storage. And so they went to Ainsley's parents' place in uh, country Bathurst, country New South Wales. And so I said to them, okay, we're all missing the glitz and glamour of of opening nights give me opening nights and they did so we've got sequin trousers and you know all that sort of thing but it was so indicative you know they were happy they were together they were with the family but they weren't on broadway mm -hmm. but so many lives went through upheaval because of covid and it wasn't just financial it was also that you know people were left kind of homeless for a while there mm -hmm. This is the cover of the book, and I think this is the last one I'll, I'll share. This is Isaiah Firebrace, the most beautiful young man you'll ever meet, a young Indigenous singer. He um, obviously represented us um, for Eurovision a couple of years ago. He won um, one of those, um, I want to say Australia's Got Talent or, you know, those sort of things. Sorry, Isaiah, I can't remember. Um, but a very proud Indigenous man. Um, and he was on The Masked Singer and things like that. And when I went to photograph him, I said, well, because the process for me of taking a portrait is not go in, shoot and leave. I like a good chat, which you might have noticed. Um, but I also feel as though I must get to know my subject before I photograph them. I'm not a point and shoot in a studio sort of portraitist. That's just not who I am. So I talked to everybody about what they were doing before we set the shots up. And I said to Isaiah, you know, tell me what you've been doing. And he had been writing and singing. So this is in his home studio. Um, so writing new material. But he'd also been learning to meditate. 
and also been learning more about his heritage and his father actually designed that t-shirt and he said to me look this is a t-shirt my dad um, designed I said put it on I want I want to photograph you in this and so every person that I photographed for this series um, I asked them beforehand to trust me and say I don't want to show you your portrait do you mind will you just trust me and they all said yes which was really nice to be trusted to that level until I saw this in the back of my camera and uh, I've got a big shout out to Nikon because the Z series cameras just allow so much flexibility in you know low light situations like this and and a really good sized screen and um, and this flashed up on my screen as I'd taken it I said to Isaiah I actually need to show you this and he said I thought I wasn't allowed to see it and I said I think we've just shot the cover and I showed it to him and I said you look amazing everything you've been doing is in one one photograph and so that's kind of um, where it was. And I'm happy to say that it's um, hanging now as a finalist in the um, National Portrait Prize, National Photographic Portrait Prize. So it's hanging in the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra, um, even though I can't get up there to see it, <laughs> which is a bit unfortunate, but I will get up there. And, um, and I'm very proud that, you know, there were over 3,000 entrants into the National photographic portrait prize and uh, there were I think 73 of us who were finalists mm. so in and a really um, a really really proud moment for me as a photographer but to know how this series and this portrait came about makes it even more special so you know, uh, and it really does sum up that um, the strength I think of of the arts industry, um, it's a really powerful image for you to have selected as your your cover. So yeah, resilience, relations. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so before we um, we will get to some questions a bit later on at uh, soon, but um, seeing as we are um, chatting during Photo Book Weekend, um, let's talk through the process of um, putting together an exhibition is one thing, but putting together a book um, is a whole other process. And I <laughs> think this is your first. Yes. So um, uh, maybe we could talk through some of the do's and don'ts. <laughs> and, and also some of the, um, I understand it was a really collaborative process yeah. um, putting this book together. So um, can you share with us how, um, how you went about putting this book together? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you talked about the collaborative process and I'm so grateful for the people who helped me out along the way. So um, I've got a, a group of, women that I meet with every Wednesday for drinks you know on zoom um, my wonder women Wednesday wonder women and they supported me through all this kooky idea of what I was going to do um, and then there were of course the donors and financial backers who once I said this is what I want to do went no brainer let's back this the Australian Cultural Fund um, the magnificent um, support of Les Walkling who you know people who are into photography will know Les is one of the legends in the world, not just in Australia. And so he was instrumental in the editing. Um, the curation, how do you pick your favourite baby out of each series? And uh, Jason Smith, of course, who was at NGV and Heidi and now director of Geelong Gallery, um, helped in that respect. So, so many people. And then, as I said, it was going to be 20 photographs. And then when I got the, the um, offer to do the major exhibition at Sofitel um, and take over the whole of the 35th floor, I said, well, it needs a catalogue. Actually, it needs a book. And that's when it became the advocacy piece. And as I was ramping up well over 20 images, um, I knew it had a lot more strength to it. And so I had no idea how to publish a book at all so thank you to James Milligan from JM Publishing for helping guide me through that and um, and so I knew that I wanted it square I knew what I wanted on the cover and I've got to say there's a lot of argy-bargy goes 
you know, backwards and forwards as to how the layout will be. And I stuck to my guns. Thanks again, James, for indulging me. Um, but it's an interesting process because we had to decide everything from how it looks and how it feels. And I'm a very tactile person. So um, that was important for me. But also, where would it be made? And then because we didn't know when we were going to open up again for the exhibition because of COVID, all of a sudden I got an opening date of the first week of February and I went, okay, it was the first week of December. I guess that excludes me from producing a book overseas where you know the price is about a third of the price. I really wanted to publish in Australia, but it is expensive to say the least. And you know, to start off with a thousand books was a lot of money. And um, so I decided, no, we would definitely publish in Australia. Um, and produce the finished product in Australia. And I'm so proud of that. Um, and it was just the process of, you know, registering it and doing all that sort of thing. And, and I guess that was the handy thing about having a publisher at that stage. So I feel as though I'm sort of semi self-published because I had to raise all the, the funds myself. Um, and it's not something you, <laughs> you ever think you're going to hand out a lot of money over. But it became such an important piece to me because of what was happening in my life and because of what I was seeing happening in the industry that a book was the only logical thing for me to do and I had to see the project through. It wasn't going to be enough just to have an exhibition. It needed to be a book and it needed to be something I could hand to arts ministers and treasurers and premiers and say, please read the plight of our people. Mm -hmm. And so with um, with the book, uh, what, what do you hope is the outcome then when you do hand it over? Um, what sort of responses have you had from people that you're handing the book over to? Amazing. Amazing. They've been so um, embracing of the idea that they are each a little snapshot. So it's not one long continuous read. They can pick it up, have a look at a photograph and see the story to go with it. But also the fact, you know, as I said before, that if we, not if, when we have another pandemic, that people will be able to pick it up for inspiration. So there was a young triple threat in the book, for example, who had always wanted to learn the ukulele. So there's a picture of her on a couch learning the ukulele. So hopefully, you know, somebody further down the track says, what do I do? My life's over. You know, <laughs> I, I can't find inspiration. And they pick up this book and they go, huh. I could learn a new instrument or something like that. So I want it to be there as a positive um, lever, if you like, for the next time we're subjected to these sort of circumstances. Mm. And so with um, the, the, the back, back to the, the group of people that you worked with in the development of this book, yeah. um, I mean, you're in a position um, because of your passion and involvement in, in the arts and in theatre uh, and because of your work um, as a politician where perhaps you might have better contacts um, starting out or better resource, uh, you're, not, you're slightly better resource than someone who's much earlier in their career wanting to establish a photo book. So what sort of advice would you give to someone who's sort of at, at an earlier stage? Um, it's funny, you know, because I actually see myself as an, an early in my career artist because I left my craft for so long so um, regardless of the fact that I'm now a little bit older than most people in their early career um, you know for me it was very much a starting out project and it was a labor of love um, and it wasn't about using connections from politics or anything like that I, 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 you know that, that was just irrelevant to this project but it was certainly the fact that I have such a passion for the arts. And, you know, and I've photographed everything from Saturday Night Fever to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and those sort of, you know, big um, theatrical productions. So, yes, I did know a few people. And it was their kindness and their generosity that did. So, I guess, for me, as anybody starting out at any age, if you've got an idea and you're so passionate about it that it's burning a hole in you, do it just do it find a way to, to finance it um you know it was difficult for me I won't beat around the bush to finance this project 
but there are ways and means and just go ahead and do it. And I guess as with everything in life, if you don't ask, you don't get. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a passion for, you know, photographing animals, if you don't ring the zoo or, you know, whatever and say, may I come and, you know, photograph your tree, tree sloths or whatever it is you're interested in, then you won't ever know. Mm. So pick up the phone, make the connections. And if you don't know somebody, somebody you know will know somebody. Yes. We're all connected these days. Absolutely. And I think even though... Um, we're all a bit perhaps disconnected physically. Um, if anything, you know, I've certainly found that my connections with colleagues at museums and galleries all over the world has grown stronger through um, through this period, and yeah. um, and you've shown that through through this project too. That um, you know, people putting you in touch with other people who um, they know will be interested in your project. So yeah. That's wonderful. Um, so people are able to buy your um, photo book via your website, uh, yes. www.heidivictoria.com.au. Um, yes, nice, easy one. Yes. Um, <laughs> so people can head there and purchase the book. But um, you have mentioned a couple of other places that people can see um, your work. Um, so it's currently showing as part of the photo Biennale, Ballarat International Photo Biennale in the evenings after dark. I know. How exciting is that on the town hall? I'm yes. so excited to see it. Yeah. When, whenever I can. So hopefully you can come <laughs> bring a picnic blanket and sit opposite town hall and then enjoy your, um, your outdoor exhibition. Yeah. Um, and it's been wonderful that um, uh, a number of venues and, and events have been continued um, for the Photo Biennale, including um, uh, Linda McCartney's exhibition, which we're hosting at the Art Gallery. I am so yeah. looking forward to seeing that. Yeah. You know, just the, the, the opportunities she had. Yes. You know, Absolutely. that most of us can't do. And this is, you know, in that certainly not in the same Linda McCartney sort of a way, but it's that behind the scenes, mm -hmm. almost a little bit voyeuristic, mm. you know, and this book is deliberately so. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about sharing private moments. It is. There's something um, really beautiful about the the intimacy in some of the images that, that you've captured and seeing that in, in Linda McCartney's work work too. So there's a nice, yeah, thank nice you. connection there. So. Just a, a big shout out for the book. If people do want to buy it, it's, it's a great Christmas present under $60. <laughs> and usually um, postage is $16 because it's quite heavy. It's just over a kilo. It's a, a really beautiful coffee table book. But for photo book, um, weekend and for all the BIFB people um, I'm going to do that free of charge for, for postage and also when you um, buy it online um, if you just put in the notes who you'd like that dedicated to I'll hand sign them all and dedicate them and get it shipped out to you really really shortly. Beautiful so a couple of questions um, before yeah. we finish for the day so um, we've sort of touched on a couple of these themes but um, let's let's um, explore them a bit more do you consider your work political as much as artistic um, as in does identity and storytelling have a political outcome as well for this project yes mm. quite often not so my specialty is photographing people who want to leave a legacy so you might get a, you know, a big business person who says, I actually want to leave a photo book of me behind the scenes for future generations. And so it's very specialised, it's very personal, and that's never going to see light of day, you know, in a library or an exhibition. But a project like this was extremely political, and it was about being able to share those stories, good, bad or indifferent, with people who have the opportunity to make a difference when it comes to, um, you know, funding and packages and things like that um, and support for artists when these sort of crises happen. Mm, but that isn't always the nature of your work. Um, Usually not. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I try to stay out of politics now very much. Um, but this, this project was very much about being true to the industry that I love so much. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you're, you've talked. We've talked a couple of times about you re-emerging into um, your career as a as a photographer. What are some of the challenges that you've faced, and and how have you worked to overcome them? Uh, COVID, mm. COVID, <laughs> and COVID. <laughs> so, as a theatrical photographer, 
COVID. <laughs> you know, really difficult. And now, you know, I have people who want a series of photographs of their family leading up to Christmas, and I will spend a full day with these sort of people. Um, and we can't. Mm. So, you know, that sort of thing is, is incredibly difficult. Um, the challenge, I guess, is when you look at my um, theatrical work is having been out of it for such a long time, others had filled that space, you know, where I was. So it's reestablishing myself in that genre, um, which I'm obviously passionate about. So, um, but it's, it's happening. It, well, it was happening and then COVID hit, um, but it will happen again. It will. It will. Perseverance, folks. That's that's all I can say about this industry. If you're an artist, just keep going. Mm -hmm. And back to um, tying it in with Photo Book Week, what are some of the key factors to consider to consider when converting an exhibition into a book? So maybe just sort of top three things that you um, had in mind when um, when making the change from from exhibition to book. So the fact that um, in the book I could be so much um, more free with the space. So, uh, you know, photographs, especially as most of them are taken portrait orientation, um, you know, there's a certain frame that you decide you're going to go with everything, you know, 1620 or larger or whatever, and they're all going to look quite uniform, whereas in the book, the layout has to be according to not only that image, but also the text that goes with it. So it's very much de design factors for me. Um, and that was really interesting. Also not leaving anybody out of the credits. <laughs> um, <laughs> and goodness knows no 20 that. rewrites of those. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's an interesting process. And I'd, I'd probably go through it again. You know, some people get a bit gun shy and say that was really difficult but I did have a great team around me. And most of those people I didn't know beforehand. Mm -hmm. So it was a matter of collecting the right people who were experts in their field to help, I suppose, make me look good. Um, and so that's probably the biggest thing for me. That's probably number one on the list of, if you're going to produce a book, have experts around you. Don't try and do it all yourself because I'm a photographer. Mm -hmm. I'm not a publisher. Yes. Yeah. And um, I mean, I mean, it also allows you to reach an entirely different audience. You know, you can't always get, um, say, a politician, if you're wanting to hand them a copy of the book, you can't always get them to come in to see an exhibition. Um, whereas yeah. the book is something tangible that people yeah. can, um, can then enjoy. So, yeah. Um, well, congratulations on the series and the Thank book. Thank you. Um, I hope that you get to come to Ballarat soon to enjoy the festival and everything that Ballarat has to offer, including your own um, own exhibition. And um, and it was a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much. And yay to everything that the Art Gallery of Ballarat do because you've just, can I tell you, for a relatively small, you know, physical size footprint sort of a, a gallery boy do you guys punch above your weight and you always have the most magnificent exhibitions in there so every time I'm up there I do pop in and have a look around and you know your the, your own collection is superb mm -hmm. it's been collected so well but the stuff you've been doing you know of recent years whether it be the Archibalds or whatever just yeah yay yay Ballarat thank you <laughs> Oh, thank you both so much. Um, that was such a wonderful conversation and such an insightful conversation as well. Um, and yeah, just such a treat to see a deeper look into your photographic practice and the process that came with it, creating it into a photo book. So thank you both. Um, and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. Um, I'll just let you know that there are also a few more events as part of the Photo Book Weekend, um, which we'd love for you to join. You can register through Zoom via our website. Um, so definitely encourage you to do that. We have one more coming up at 2 p.m. for today. Um, and that's an in-conversation event with David Wadalton, um, Helen Frommen and Yanni Florence, which should be really fantastic. Um, and all of our talks as part of Photo Book Weekend will be recorded and made available following the event. So they will be published next week um, and we'll share an update with you once you can watch them at a later stage. 
Um, and also just for anyone wishing to visit the Biennale, it has been extended um, until the 9th of January. So we hope that this allows Melbourne audiences and beyond potentially um, to visit us and um, explore the festival in person, which we really can't wait for more people to do. So thank you both so much again. Um, and yes, we'll end that one here, I think. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Mm -hmm.